Hi, I'm Em and this is Fangfaria. Today I'll be talking about suicide. So I've been putting off recording this for quite some time um, and I should warn anyone that's listening that it um, this may contain some triggering um, things and that you should probably be mindful of who else is in earshot as you're listening to this. Um, if you're listening to it for the first time, I certainly wouldn't recommend it for small, t- small children or people that would find this topic um, quite disturbing. So I have a friend that um, has helped me a lot with telling my stories and things like that. And one of the golden rules is don't talk from a wound, talk from a scar, talk about something you've done work on and you're at a place that you, you can discuss it without uh, falling apart yourself. I'm not 100% sure that I'm there, um, but I'm going to talk about suicide in dentistry. I'm going to talk about my experiences with suicidal ideation and uh, I guess how close I came. So it's not talked about a lot and I've been reluctant to talk about it, not just because I don't particularly want to stick a big red flag above my head. I don't particularly want to be marked out for this. Uh, There's still enough stigma around this topic and enough shame around it and enough potential consequences professionally and elsewhere that it's still hard to talk about even though... I'm talking personally about a situation that was maybe six years ago or so. So the other side of it is that um, it's also been talked about that talking about suicide and normalising it, which whilst would almost be my, my hope that it would make people feel they're not alone and that there are other people going through this that have come through the other side, um, and can see it from that lens and that perspective that normalising it can encourage people who are on that cliff edge, who are on the verge of this becoming a reality to to continue on with it. Um, And for those people, I would just say nothing lasts forever. Uh, Nothing ever did. It's it's tough to get through. You've got so many people around you that would love to help you through this. Um, and I'm going to put some uh, details in the show notes in terms of help numbers and things like that. But please feel free to reach out. Um, I'm quite happy to answer, answer any questions uh, and privately message anyone about it. So suicide... It's it's still it's talked about more. Um, we see more even in the papers about um, sudden unexpected deaths in young people or youngish people. That there's there isn't a, a reason a uh, um, cause of death offered or um, put into explanation and. That, I guess, is an improvement because before either those deaths weren't being reported or alternative reasons were being put forward, more socially acceptable reasons, uh, reasons that families could deal with better, that professions could deal with better, that society as a whole could handle more than the thought of people taking their own lives. Um... I guess my first 
knowledge of suicide growing up was um, was kind of pop culture, really, and, and Kurt Cobain suicide. And, and that was the first time I guess I'd really heard about it or knew about it, which is, seems ridiculous now because I would have been, I don't know, 14. Um, it is more reported. People are more aware of it. It's a word that my children have in their vocabulary and not through me. Um, it's something I'm quick to stamp on being joked about at home. Um, and my poor kids, they don't understand why, but I won't let them joke about suicide. For those that are unaware, New Zealand has got one of the highest youth suicide rates in the world, or in the developed world, which is uh, tough as a parent, know that you, knowing that you're bringing children up um, in that environment and that it's not un fully understood why those rates are so high. Um, I'll come back to that because I will come back to something that um, Mike King, who is an advocate for mental health in youth and um, suicide awareness in youth, uh, he, he's um, a, a great... Um, a great figure here in New Zealand and I'll get back to something he says later in terms of um, a suicide, a suicide as it relates to youth but I think it's very applicable to well anyone I think sorry there's lots and lots of pauses in this because I just it's not it just doesn't roll off the tongue or it certainly doesn't roll off the tongue yet um, so Dental suicide, it both is and isn't big news in that it, the statistics have been bounced around for ages. I knew as I went into dental school that it was a profession, one of the highest professions for suicide. I think at 18 or 17, when you're filling out that UCAS form, so the university entrance form, um, and ticking dentistry, uh, because, uh, again, in the UK, we, when you go from school, you apply straight for dentistry. I appreciate um, that in New Zealand that's not the case. You do health sciences and then apply for uh, dentistry or medicine or get picked for or invited for uh, interviews in. But, um, yeah, it wasn't like I was kind of like, I don't think I'd, I don't think it, I don't think it meant anything to me because I just thought that would never be me. I thought, well, you know, suicide, that's something that, that, you know, weak people do, other people do. It's not, it's not me. I had my own preconceptions of what it meant, of what, of how could anybody do that. Um, uh, both kind of, as I say, kind of culturally, religiously, um, all those things. And... I knew that there was a, a higher risk, but um, it's, you know, it's like everything. A 1% risk can mean everything to you if you're that 1%, and a 90% risk can mean nothing to you if you're quite sure you're that 10%. Um, and that was me as, a you know, an 18-year-old, uh, you know, six foot tall and bulletproof and uh, and ready to take on the world. It's not like in terms of kind of you know careers you were you were given a lineup and it's like I'll pick I'll pick the line that's uh, high suicide risk please um it's only as as time unfolds and time in that profession that you start to see that reality and how it applies to you and how that could be anybody as much as you might think it it never is going to be um so Statistics around dental suicides are, I'm not even going to quote any of them because they're so, You, I'll, I'll go back to my, my sixth form um, economics, I think it was um, teacher or, or something that was in um, general studies was talking about statistics and um, statistics being able to prove whatever you want them to be able to prove, meaning that you can kind of slant how the things are recorded or reported or your your population size or your group. Or, and that's why um, it's important to know how to kind of read into these things and know how big the studies were, how representative they are of the people you're trying to apply the um, findings to and, and things like that. But um, 
but is that scene amongst amongst suicide reporting more than anything else it's not necessarily reported as a cause of death because of all the shame and all of the stigma because it's not always a single cause of death that could maybe be written on those forms that um that accidental overdose rather than overdose is is subjective after the fact that um traffic related deaths uh can be uh, suicide by by car it's um there's lots of reasons why a death that is a suicide might not be reported as one uh so lots of under reporting and probably lots of inconsistencies in standards of reporting across the board or how these things are kind of covered um it's historically used to be a crime so that's a lot of the reason by the shame around it there's a lot of misinformation out there about eligibility for insurance and life insurance and things like that because historically it was if you were if it was deemed a suicide then nobody inherited anything and and, and uh, assets were, were taken away by um or governments or local authorities or, or whoever so th th there is history to why there's that thought pattern around it and it contributes to that shame and that stigma um there's lots of things from saying that dentists are ridiculously higher risk than the general population that higher risk from uh, of all the medical professions because of the isolation the loneliness and the complete kind of one-on-one -on -one nature and the buck stops with you kind of part of it particularly in a single chair practice um the uh there's also stats to say that um that in terms of general suicide statistics that women are um women women are recording a higher rate of su death by suicide uh in the dental profession versus the the rest of the population um, and then there are others that have done studies since and, 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 and try and rubbish this to, to various degrees. So short version is um, there are dentists dying out there of suicide. It is too many and it's too often. And most of us um, in the profession, if we can't name someone we knew very well, um, then there's only really two degrees of separation between multiple people that we knew Um and we'll know as our careers go on, unfortunately. My first experience of dental suicide was actually one that I didn't, um, I didn't realise until later. And I was talking to um, my mum and uh, one of my friends from primary school, her dad was a dentist uh, and he took his own life. Um, I knew nothing about that. Um, I knew that he died, but that was that was it. Um, the next really sad case was a first year dental school uh, student, first year dental student at my dental school when I was um, I must have been in fourth year because I was one of the student presidents, and I was asked to go to this student's funeral uh, on behalf of the dental school. And um, uh, we both went, uh, um, possibly a member of staff, I can't remember, but uh, I can remember being very confronted by it all because dental school hadn't addressed it as such. Again, just addressed as a sudden death. Uh, it was known throughout the dental school the nature of the death and it would be a fair assumption to say that it was suicide and it was very confronting for me and this is my issues more than anything else in terms of my awareness and thoughts around suicide to that point to be in a funeral where people were ignoring that that is was what was happened. I mean, now I can look back and say that, that you know, it's just a family trying to celebrate a life. Um, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I found it, um, I found it very difficult 
to hear that it wasn't acknowledged, I found it very difficult to grieve with the respect I would have for another kind of death at a funeral. And I take a lot of um, guilt and shame from that, that having experienced what I've experienced, that I couldn't have been more compassionate and more open-minded that um, I didn't know them that well but that uh, on the back of that nothing was done nothing was said nothing was changed nothing just nothing Um, and that that was okay because it wasn't, and that's the way a lot of suicide is dealt with, particularly within the profession. In fact, I'm going to, um, I'm going to read you a quote. So uh, part of the reason this this episode came about was, uh, one, I was asked to fill in a summary, you know, or submit a summary of my last 10 years of practice to my dental school for the alumni magazine. And I thought, I'm not going to gloss over this. I'm going to share my experiences. So in black and white, in that that's being released this month, will be, as I'm, as I'm going to talk about soon, um, my experiences with suicidal ideation and my down points and lowest points of my career and my life. Uh, laid bare because we don't talk about it. And we do brush it under the carpet or sweep it to the side in the shadows and it doesn't do justice to the people that are having those experiences. And it's not going to change anything. And it's not going to help the people coming through that are facing these dark times and decisions and conflicts in their lives. It doesn't do anyone any justice. So this is um, from the book by Adam Kay um, called This Is Going to Hurt, which has been popularized into a a tv series Uh, and in fact he's left medicine and now he's now a full-time kind of writer um, both for tv and 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 books um it's been televised in the uk and whilst i've not seen the second series i'm not even sure i managed to get through the first series i found the book very jarring um because it uh reflected a lot of my experiences but um there was something in the paper the other day about a tree being planted in memorial memoriam for doctors and NHS workers who had committed suicide which is huge Uh, and whether that tree was actually planted I'm not sure but I know that people have been looking for it since and um, so yeah I just wanted to do my bit to address this Uh, and I'm going to read an excerpt of his book and this is from um, so his book is kind of an excer- excerpt from his diary. Uh, and this is just about a day in A&E. So it's Tuesday the 31st of July 2007. One of the house officers turned up in A&E last night, having attempted suicide with an overdose of antidepressants. There's a shared sense of numbness amongst the doctors. The only surprise is it doesn't happen more often. You're given a huge responsibility, minimal supervision, and absolutely no pastoral support. You work yourself to exhaustion, pushing yourself beyond what could be reasonably expected of you, and end up constantly feeling like you don't know what you're doing. Sometimes it just feels that way, and you're actually doing fine, and sometimes you really don't know what you're doing. Happily, this occasion is the latter, and she'd taken a completely harmless dose of antidepressants. In any other profession, if someone's job drove them to attempt suicide, you'd expect some kind of inquiry into what happened and a concerted effort to make sure it never happened again. Yet nobody said anything. We all just heard from friends, like we were in the school playground. I doubt we'd have got so much in an e- as an email if she died. I'm pretty unshockable. But I'll be ne- I'll never be I'll never cease to be amazed by hospitals' willful ineptitude when it comes to caring for their own staff. 
so that's obviously about doctors but it reminded me of this experience with a dental student and it reminded me of many instances in Facebook groups um, or communities where you hear of a sudden death and it's the whispers and the chatting just like they said like you're in a school playground is is how you find out what happened that none of it is addressed by the profession that that non oh, just just we need to do better we need to do better uh, and this is about raising awareness that we do need to do better and that steps need to be taken and that it's 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 okay to talk about it and it's okay to say that exactly what happened so that was as i say my first kind of experience and and i was on the other side of that experience with that dental student in terms of i was that part of society that was judging with the stigma that's associated with it. My experience is quite difficult to process still. Um, and it was, it was only when I, I kind of caught myself planning my own suicide that I realised that this had to stop. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to talk about. It's hard to have told my husband that I was willing to leave him, in essence. It's hard to know that when my children are old enough, because I am talking about it, that they're going to have questions and judgments of their own, that my parents will have judgments, that the grief isn't stopped by it not happening, that um, that it labels me as a weaker person, as a, a risk, I guess. I don't know. So I'm going to get back and reference somebody else because other people's words are always best when I'm losing my own. Um, uh, so I think I've I think I've talked in a blog piece. I don't know whether I've actually talked on the podcast about this, but there was a, a TEDx talk by um, John Neuenberg who talked about the cultural taboos around suicide. And uh, there was a lot of things in there that, that resonated but also can help um, explain to people that haven't necessarily dealt with these feelings firsthand why why it even comes to to be um so it, it normally follows depression um not always but but quite often and depression and mental health problems come with their own amount of stigma and issues and again is something don't want to be labeled with i've I've been depressed and I've never been diagnosed with depression. That's not because I haven't had depression. It's because I would never have that conversation with my doctor. Still, even though I'm here having it on the, you know, on the World Wide Web. Um, it's, I don't, I, I don't want that official label. I don't want it raised as a red flag officially. Um... Yeah, I know that doesn't make sense. Um, I don't particularly want to be prescribed antidepressants. And that's silly too. Uh, a talk I heard by um, Nigel Larter a few years ago was talking about, you know, would how would you judge a patient who had an infection but didn't take antibiotics? Um it's 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 the same for depression. It's it's a medical tool to help you to help you get better, and to help you through the initial part of finding the rest of the coping tools yourself. But again, it's still not something I'm comfortable with. So uh, John 
um, Ewan Berg goes on to say that, that depression makes you feel makes suicide feel like a reasonable way to solve the problems you fell, face and I, I that's so true it's you get in such or I got in such a dark place and such negative self-talk in terms of being broken and not being able to fix it myself and not being able to climb out of this dark hole and not feeling like I was in an ever decreasing circle that it was it was getting harder not easier that I was getting more miserable not better that I was infecting those around me with with my misery and lack of wanting to do anything and all of those things that you get to the point where you start to feel that everybody is going to be better if you just weren't be here being this miserable that the only way to stop the pain you're in is to just not be here anymore because it would just all stop um and again john goes on to say that that when you're depressed suicide looks like it makes sense i mean i look i look back now and i know that it makes no sense that you know how could three young children and my husband and my parents and my friends and everybody around me be better off without me no matter how broken I am if I think about people with similar relationships to me and I think about what it would be like to lose them and what I wouldn't do to help then you know with this this perspective years away and much further removed and in a much better place, although I don't sound like it. Um, you know, it, it, it takes on a different perspective and that's, I think, a lot of the problem around the stigma side of it is that people are looking in through their own lenses and if you're feeling okay, then no, it doesn't look like it makes sense and no, it looks like something incredibly selfish and... How could anyone feel that way or do such a thing? Because um, it does, I mean, it goes against every instinct we have as a, as a human um, to take a life, uh, ours included, that it's, that, yeah, you just, yeah, you get in a, you get in a spot where it just, you run, you seems like you run out of options and it's just intolerable. Um, and that's, Again, what he alludes to in this talk is that feeling trapped in an intolerable situation makes depression and suicide possible. That people attempting suicide don't want to die. It's a desperate act to relieve pain. And that the question we should be asking instead of why the suicide is why the pain. And if we've got so many people in our profession going through this... What, what are the common denominators? What, what are we missing that we could address at a bigger level to, to get to that pain before it gets to this point? There's lots of... I read uh, Viktor Frankl's book a while ago and that talks about um, the loss of hope and the loss of purpose and meaning uh, in terms of... Um, the Nazi um, concentration camps and work camps um, in terms of what he observed as a as a psychologist um, in terms of, of patterns of when when there would be people um, dying so this isn't this isn't by suicide as such but when people give up um, and it's it's that not seeing a way out. It's that holding on and saying it was going to be Chris, it was going to be over at Christmas, and then Christmas comes around and it's still the same. And because I've fixated so much on being fixed by a certain point or it being over by a certain point, that they can't cope with um, that when it passes. That the people who made it through and through those times managed to kind of bring back in their focus. Uh, to shorter term and not be fixed on a certain point but if I can get through this if I can get through the next day if I can find a way to do this or make this better with, with the people that tended to get get through um so 
I mean, I see it as it is a bit of, for me. It was it was losing hope. I I didn't have any hope that I knew how to get out of this on my own. That I was broken beyond repair, and that what I was going through was was poisoning those around me. It would be probably my best description. Um, but something I want to wanted to talk about as I alluded to earlier was what Mike King said about youth suicide um he said he said two things he said they want two things they want to be loved and they want to know that their thoughts and opinions are being valued by significant adults in their life and it's not happening now whilst this is talking about youth and it's talking about um society or parents or teachers or 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 those that are around these um youths as they're going through this I think in our profession, it's we we want to feel valued, we want to feel significant, we want to feel that we're achieving things, and the way that the profession is set up at the moment, we don't always feel those things. Sometimes it feels like a loaded game that's a, set in favour of the patients and complainants, and set in terms of levels of achievement to an impossible standard to keep and maintain whilst living life and going through the ups and downs of life and going through the everyday stresses and the big lifetime events and the things that will throw us off our game and off our perfect or textbook day that It's on those days when we probably need the most compassion and the most help that we feel like we're being judged because those are the days when we're not likely to be hitting as close to perfect as possible but really just scraping by to do good enough and it can feel unfair and it can feel lonely we can feel like we're the bad guy. It can feel like, as a profession, somehow we got divorced from medicine, that we ended up being the second-hand car salesman of the medical world, that we're underfunded by government systems, yet compared equally in terms of charging to those systems which are subsidised. And it's hard. And it's hard to be told that you're in a profession that's hated. It's hard to be told every day that you're charging too much. That um, that what do you have to moan about? I mean, there's, there's great things about this job. But it's it's very high stress. And I would challenge anyone to reconsider any thoughts that are not that the dentist is doing nothing but trying to do the best by you there's no ill intent in anything that happens but that we are just human like our medical colleagues Um, but somehow we're expected to be beyond that and something else that Mike King talks about is that Having problems and thoughts won't kill you, but holding on to those problems and thoughts and thinking you're the only one going through it, that's the killer. And that's why, whilst this isn't polished and I'm not beyond this quite yet, and I would love to be in a place where I could actually stand up in in front of people and talk about this without being complete baggage, I have to, I still have to speak up. It's my duty to speak up. So I'm going to leave you with um, another excerpt from the back of, I think it's um, Adam Kay's book. And uh, it makes reference to uh, UCAS forms again, which is a university entrance form. He writes, And I realised there was a simpler, better answer to what can I do to help? 
one we can all do that takes very little effort. Ask them how their day was. They'll say fine and change the subject or pull focus with some funny anecdote or other. But let them understand that they've always got someone to talk to. Someone who understands that the days are never actually just fine. That the nature of illness means more bad things happen at work than good. And keep on asking. Give them that opportunity to offload at the end of every shift. Whether it's a tiny irritation, a rant or a full-on sob. Chip away at the ingrained notion that doctors and nurses don't need to or shouldn't talk about these things. Because that same ingrained notion is partially responsible for the huge rise in people leaving the profession. The rise in stress-related absence and illness among those who stay and the tragic rise in suicide amongst those who find it just too much. We all need someone to talk to. Don't let them bottle it up. Let them know you're there. Care for the carer. Even though they've got a stethoscope around their neck and a decent line in gallows humour, they're still just that teenager who arbitrarily put a tick next to medicine on their UCAS form. Just a human, as fragile as anyone. And that's, that sums up so much that I think about how we need to look after our colleagues in dentistry. We're just human. And as humans, we can be incredibly fragile. And it's okay. It's okay to ask for help and it's okay to support each other. I think back on all of this and I hope that it reaches somebody that needs it. I hope that it prevents anyone having the experience I had at that funeral all those years ago. I hope that it breaks down barriers for finding empathy and understanding for people and families who are going through this. That we can break through the stigma that's been so ingrained in our lives. I hope that not only having been brave enough to record this, that I'm brave enough to release it and not take it down. I have come out the other side of this incredible journey. And it's not without its ups and downs now. And I'm not naive enough to think that that might not be the only time I visit low places in my career. But I'm better armed now. I know that I'm not alone. I know that I've got support around me. And I know that people understand. So have hope. Find what lights you up within your work. Find the values you started with and check you're still aligned with them in your work. Find purpose and meaning in what you do. And there's a way out for all of us. As always, do chat um, through Facebook and Twitter. And um, yeah, if you just, if you can't reach out to anyone in terms of asking for help, just do what Adam says, just ask them how the day was and keep asking. All right, take care.